Hey, uh, you know that last verse that said, uh, when my day is coming and my life's coming to an end, uh, I was standing there, I was about to hit Mark and say, you know that's us, but I didn't. <laughs> but it is uh, some of us, and um, I would like to say um, that I've outlived my father, I've outlived my mother, uh, I've outlived my grandfather, my grandmother, and I praise the Lord for that, but you know, um, I got a lot less time in front of me than I got behind me. And I just want to say to you that when I was in seminary uh, back in the early 1970s as a young person like you and wanted to dedicate my life to the service of Christ, um, I had no idea how sweet that was going to be when I got to be 68 years old. Um, there is joy in serving Jesus, the old hymn says. And not only have I had the privilege of experiencing that joy, uh, some hardship too, but the joy of waking up every day to serve the living Christ. But let me just say at this point in my life, looking back, you can't go back and get that time. And if you didn't serve Christ in that time, then friends, there's nothing you can do about it. You can mourn about it, you can pine about it, but you can't get it back. So I am proud of you guys for being here, you young adults. I'm proud of you for wanting to give your life to the service of Christ. And I'm just here to tell you that I promise you, if you do that faithfully, when you get to be 60 or 70 years old, you're going to say, thank you, Jesus, that I used those years for you when I had the opportunity to do it. Nothing, nothing in life replaces that wonderful joy of being able to present your life to Christ um, as you're getting ready to finish your earthly journey and say, Lord Jesus, to the best of my ability, it was all yours. I did everything I could with it for you. Man, man, it's wonderful. Just trust me and don't get discouraged and stay strong in your call if God's called you to serve the Lord. Okay, that was not the sermon. That was just uh, an introduction. Um, and what I'm about to say is not the sermon either yet, quite. Um, remember, we've been doing a little tutorial on expository preaching. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me that expository preaching is like common sense. You know what they say, common sense isn't common. You, you've heard that, right? Well, good preaching is not common either. I don't care what kind of preaching, whether it's topical or expository, it's not common. And there are reasons that good preaching um, is there. When you meet it, when you hear it, when you see it, uh, there, are, there, are, there are reasons for good preaching. And I've been trying to share some of them with you. It's not rocket science. God has taught us in the Word about how to do good preaching. And yesterday I said to you that there are two components of great preaching. One of them is a human component, and we talked about uh, exposition, communication, and organization as the human side of good preaching. Today, I, I want to talk to you for just a moment about the spiritual side of good preaching. Uh, I believe that this is an ignored side of good preaching because, number one, it's not taught very much, because, number two, we don't see it practiced very much by our preachers. And number three, it's just plain hard work. And it's easier not to do it. And I'm talking about walking into the pulpit with an unction from the Holy Spirit on your life, that moment, to preach the Word of God. Now, unction is an old word. Some of you are going to have to go home and Google it because you don't even know what it means. But unction is the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our preaching and on our teaching of God's Word that empowers it to people's lives, that empowers it to their consciences, that empowers it to their wills, that causes them to repent, that causes them to surrender and obey God. That is unction. And friends, you don't get unction from a good outline to your sermon. You don't get unction from having good exposition to your sermon. And you don't get it from being a wonderful communicator. 
You can be a wonderful communicator, and everybody can love listening to you, but that doesn't mean it's going to have unction, because it doesn't mean it's going to change anybody's life. Somebody walking out of church and going, wow, that was really enjoyable to listen to. I love listening to that guy. That's not unction. Unction is when people walk out of church and say, man, Jesus convicted me today that I need to change something in my life. Jesus convicted me today that I need to repent in some area of my life, and I'm going to do it. Jesus convicted me today that I need a course correction, or Jesus encouraged me today to press on even though life is hard. Jesus and gave me hope today that I'm living the right way and I'm heading in the right direction and I'm not going to turn back. This is unction when you walk out of church and you know the Holy Spirit has talked to your heart and has delivered a message to your heart and you know there's action required whether it's perseverance, whether it's repentance, whether it's a course correction, whether it is to go and, uh, and apologize to somebody, whether it is to forgive your mother or your father, it doesn't matter, but that God has spoken to you and you're going to do something about it. That's unction. And folks, without unction, there cannot be good preaching. Sorry, you can't do it. Now, where do we get unction from? You say, yeah, is there like Unction 301 here at Dallas? No, no. You can't get unction from a course. You can't get unction from a pill. You can't get unction from a seminar. You can't get unction from a book. Unction comes from the Holy Spirit himself on your life, falling on you like that dove fell on the Lord Jesus Christ when he was baptized and empowering you, and filling you, and using you, and flowing through you as you are delivering the Word of God. You say, and how do I get that? Friends, you get that on your knees. That's the only place you can get that. And this is what we don't do so often. We have great exposition. We have great um, communication skills that we've honed in homiletics. We've got great interpretation skills that we've honed in hermeneutics. We've got good outline that we know is a, is a powerful one-point simple sentence outline. Yesterday, right? Okay. If you weren't here yesterday, you need to listen to the message about this. And you can walk in with all of that. But folks, that's only part of it. You got to walk in with unction. You got to get on your knees and you got to seek Christ and you got to say, Lord Jesus, I confess my sins. And you got to say, Lord Jesus, I just don't confess the sins everybody confesses lust and, 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 and overeating and whatever. But I got to confess those secret sins of pride and arrogance. And, and self-sufficiency, that I think this sermon is so good that I don't even need you to deliver this sermon. I got this one. Nonsense. Nonsense. But that's how we go in the pulpit many times. And I'm embarrassed to say that for years, that's how I went into the pulpit, because I was lazy, because I was spiritually lukewarm, because I was backslidden in my prayer life and I went into the pulpit like that and built a church of fairly good size like that but it was not what Christ really had for me and he had to convict me that I was wrong and this happened several years ago and take me to a different level in my prayer life take me to my prayer closet that's an old word too by the way, a prayer closet does not mean you got a real closet. I mean, you can have a closet if you want, but it means having a private place to go and meet with God. And most of us today, I'm using all my preaching time, most of us today do prayer light. You know prayer light? Prayer light, you know, I'm shaving, dear Jesus, or 
Dear Jesus, I'm sorry. I want you to do this. Or dear Jesus, here we are. I'm trying. I'm looking out my mirrors, but I'm praying. Or dear Jesus, I it's been a good day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Folks, this is prayer light. This is American prayer. This is not biblical prayer. This is not the way the great saints prayed. This is not the way the apostles prayed. This is the way we Americans so often pray. This is the way our preachers pray. And this will never produce great preaching. You got to walk into the pulpit so that every single person sitting in the audience senses. You don't have to tell them, I got unction today. You want me to tell them? Friends, don't do that. If you got unction, people will know you got it. You don't need to tell them anything. Their spirits will sense it. Their spirits will leap up to meet it. Their spirits will recognize it if you're up there with the unction of Christ on your life. And your preaching will reflect it. Your teaching will reflect it. And until you've got it, my recommendation is don't walk into that pulpit. Don't walk into that lectern. You stay on your knees till you get it. There's a famous story about praying Hyde. I don't know if you know him, the great English missionary, that he was at his church one day and it was time for him to go on. It's a true story. And they went back in the room and said, Dr. Hyde, it's time for you to go on. He said, I'm not ready. Sing another hymn. So they did. And he was praying. And he, they came back and got him and said, well, we sang one more hymn. It's time for you to go on. He said, I'm not ready. Sing another hymn. And they said, well, how are we going to know when you're ready? He said, I'll know when I'm ready. And when I'm ready, I'll come on the stage. And he was waiting and praying for that unction that he knew he had to have from God. Now, I don't recommend you do that when you're a visiting preacher somewhere. <laughs> Get up early in the morning. Maybe Mr. Hyde got up late that day. I don't know. <laughs> but get up and make sure you've got that on your life. And friends, let me just say in closing that um, unction is like manna. You, you can't run on yesterday's manna. You can't run on yesterday's unction. It's got to be fresh and new and vibrant each and every day. Um, and, and you know what? Nobody wants to do it. I got up this morning. I got to be honest with you. And I started going over my message and I thought, wow, you know, that's a pretty good message, uh, Lord, and, uh, that you gave me. And I'm, I'm excited to deliver it. And the Lord said to me, but you need to get on your knees and you need to get unction. And I was like, oh, golly, I did it two mornings in a row. Lord, <laughs> I'm tired this morning. I don't feel like doing it this morning, really, honestly. Can't I just run on what I did yesterday? You know, give me some, some unction, pay it forward credit or something. <laughs> and, 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 he, and the Lord was very clear, Lon, first of all, you know that's not right. And second of all, you, you big hypocrite. You're going to walk in there and talk to these students about having unction, and you won't get on your knees and do it? What a hypocrite you are. Anyway, that was enough to get me on my knees, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> folks, I know you don't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Our flesh doesn't want to do it. That's why we don't do it. That's why most preachers don't do it. And that's why there's not much great preaching in America. You go to Korea, you won't see this. You go to China, you won't see this. Those people get up and they know how to pray. You go to South America, those people know how to pray. We Americans, we're lazy. So just let me say to you on behalf of one lazy Mer American to another, <laughs> folks, you want to do great preaching, let me tell you where it comes from. Yeah, exposition, yeah, communication, yeah, organization, but most of all, unction. You understand? You be a man or a woman who goes out there and understands that that's what you need, and then take the time to do it. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God today. We pray as we open it and study it that you indeed might move among us with power and with reality. Lord, I pray today that you would lift people's hearts. Lord, seminary's hard. Living is hard. 
and we have problems and we have issues. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that through your word today, you would bring hope to our, our hearts. You would bring encouragement to our spirits. You would bring, Lord, a new rising up of tenacity and perseverance to our hearts. I pray the word of God today would be mighty as it intersects with our lives. And God, I do pray for unction today for myself, and I pray for unction for our, each of these people, that you would open their hearts so the word of God can penetrate it and permeate it. And I pray for myself that Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would have a clean and unclogged vessel to move through. Oh God, today, we pray against the enemy as we have done every day, and as we must do every day. And Lord, we ask you to grant him no entrance to this place. Lord, this is your chapel. This is your seminary. This is your time with your people. Deliver us from his distractions and grant, Lord Jesus, that the word of God might be the focus of our lives today. And we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. All right. Well, as you know, I'm doing some messages with you that I've been doing with our church family verse by verse through the book of Acts. And I want to talk to you today about God's unfailing faithfulness to the Jewish people and about how that then affects your life and my life. Okay? And so if you need a one sentence, I don't normally do this, but I'm going to tip you off. Um, if, if you need to know what the one sentence is that drives this message, is that God was faithful to Israel and he'll be faithful to you too. Got it? That's the sermon. All right, now let's go do it to get back to what we just, to the one sentence. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 3. Peter's preaching to the Jewish people in the court of the temple and he said, but you disown the holy and righteous one and killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And now, brethren, I know you did it through ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets, that the Messiah would suffer, God has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore. And turn to God that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before but whom heaven must receive until the time comes for God to restore all things. Back to the way they were. Back to before the Garden of Eden as he promised through his holy prophets since the world began. Now, what's Peter talking about here? Peter is talking about the second coming of Christ. Peter is talking about the institution of the millennial kingdom of Christ. And he goes on to say, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel on as many as have spoken have foretold these days, these messianic kingdom days. You, Jewish people, are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Say the next three words with me. For, come on. Uh, I, there you go. For, come on, for you first. Say it again. For you first, Jewish people, God raised up his servant Jesus and sent him to bless you, Jewish people, by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Now, folks, here's the point I want us to see is that when Peter was preaching this sermon here in Acts chapter 3, it was after the Jewish people had rejected Jesus as their Messiah. It was after the Jewish people had denied him before Pilate, and it was after the Jewish people had sent him to the cross. 
And yet here's the question, had God rejected them because they did all of this? What's the answer? No, of course not. Here he is in Acts chapter 3. God is still offering. Look what he's still offering these Jewish people. Even after they did all of this, verse 19, he's offering to blot out their sins. Verse 19, he's offering them the times of refreshment from the Lord, a chance to be part of the Messianic kingdom. Verse 26, he's offering to give them first the salvation of God, if they'll repent and come to Christ. Number four, he's offering, verse 24, to fulfill every promise he made to them through the Old Testament prophets. And finally, number five, he's still calling them, verse 25, the sons of the covenant which God made with your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. Do we all see this? Do we all see this? Yes. Okay, good. And folks, this bond, this loyalty, this affection to the Jewish people by God continues throughout the rest of the New Testament. Acts chapter 5, and daily in the temple. So if they were in the temple, who were they talking to? What kind of people? Jewish people, yeah. They, the apostles, kept right on teaching and preaching and offering these Jewish people Jesus as the Messiah. And even 25 years later, in Acts chapter 28, the apostle Paul arrives in Rome in chains because of his missionary activity. And he says to the Jewish people in Rome, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of whom? Israel. Israel. You say, all right, well, Lon, wait a minute. Why, why are we making such a big deal out of all of this? Well, the answer is, friends, because there's some really bad theology out there. This bad theology is called replacement theology. Replacement theology is the teaching that because the majority of the Jewish people rejected Jesus as their Messiah, that God in turn rejected them and condemned them as a race and gave their covenants and their promises to the church instead. In other words, the church replaced Israel. Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trypho in the second century, wrote and said, we as Christians, not the Jews, shall inherit the Holy Land. Augustine, the great church father of the 4th century, said the Jews have been cast off by God. And this bad theology dominated church doctrine from the 2nd century until the 20th century. So you say, oh, well, so what, Lon? So, so the church believed a little bit of bad theology. I mean, what difference does it make? Is it really that serious? Friends, it's very serious. Listen to me. Look here. Look at me. Bad theology always results in bad behavior. Do you hear what I'm saying? Bad theology always results in bad behavior, and this particular bad theology resulted in some horrible behavior by the church. It resulted in massive Christian anti-Semitism. You say, what do you mean by Christian anti-Semitism? I mean anti-Semitism that was justified and promulgated by the church, where it was taught that Jewish people were nothing more than contemptible Christ killers who'd been left on earth by God to be punished for their rejection of Christ and who deserved every evil thing they got. John Chrysostom, in the 4th century, said it is because, talking to Jewish people, you killed Christ, that there is now no restoration, no mercy, and no defense for you. End of quote. Hey, in 1099, the Crusaders massacred tens of thousands of Jews, not just in the Holy Land, but all the way along the path to the Holy Land. 
In 1290, Edward I threw all the Jews out of England. In 1394, Charles VI threw all the Jews out of France. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And Ferdinand, Ferdinand and Isabella threw all the Jews out of Spain, the ones they didn't kill in the Inquisition. The Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D., referred to by Dan Brown in his book, uh, which, is, oh, oh, by the way, which, this is the only thing he got right in the whole stinking book, was the date of the Council of Nicaea. All right. <laughs> he said at the Council of Nicaea, the Jews were branded as an odious people. The Synod of Clermont, 535 A.D., forbid any Jew from holding public office in Europe. The Fourth Lateran Council, 1215 A.D., declared that all Jews must wear yellow badges. And the Synod of Breslau in 1267 A.D. required that Jews all over Europe must live in ghettos separated from Christians and Christian society. You ever wonder how the Jews ended up in all those ghettos at the time of the Nazis? They were put there by the church. And you say, wait a minute, Lon. Real born-again people couldn't have been doing all this. I mean, these were just like, these were just like nominal Christians, right? I mean, they were just like, you know, Methodists and Unitarians, right? Um, all right, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Not about Unitarians, I'm not. But there's some good Methodists out there, a few. All right. You say, Lon, real Christians couldn't have been doing this. Oh, really? Listen, and I quote, Their synagogues should be set on fire and spread over with dirt. Their homes should be broken down and destroyed. Passport and traveling privileges should be forbidden to all Jews. Let them stay at home, and if we're afraid that they might harm us, then let us do what other countries have done and drive them out of our country for all time. End of quote. You know who said this? Martin Luther. That's exactly right. You think he was a real Christian? I would think so. Historian Raul Hilberg in his book, The Destruction of the European Jews, said this, and I quote, listen carefully. Indeed, Almost every anti-Semitic law in Nazi legislation came from laws previously passed by church councils and synods through the centuries, end of quote. You say, Lon, how can this be? Friends, I just told you, bad theology results in bad behavior. And this is why it's so important for us to get our theology right, not just on this area, but on every area. And you know, the book of Acts gives us the right theology about the Jewish people. I mean, we've already seen in Acts 2, in Acts 3, in Acts 5, in Acts 28, that God had not cast away or rejected or replaced the Jewish people. No. And listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 11. He says, I say then, has God cast away his people? What's the answer? Certainly not. Certainly not. Skipping down now to verse 2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Again I ask, verse 11. Did they, the Jewish people, stumble so as to fall beyond a recovery? What's the answer? No. Not at all. Rather by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. You guys got in on this thing because the Jewish people fumbled the ball. You understand? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes. You're grafted in, Romans 11 says. You're not part of the natural plant like I am. You're grafted in. Be, be thankful. <laughs> now, listen. Verse 12, Romans 11. If, the Jew, if their Jewish transgression is riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? You say, the Jews' fullness? What does that mean? Well, 
Paul goes on to say, for if their rejection of Jesus is the reconciliation of the world, then what will their what? What's the next word? Say it. Acceptance, Acceptance of Jesus be, but life from the dead. Friends, listen, what the Bible is telling us here is that the Jewish people are coming back around again one day from rejecting Jesus to accepting Jesus. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, that a partial hardening, the word hardening is the word we get our word callous from, a partial callousing has happened to Israel. What this means is that every person comes into our world spiritually blind, Ephesians 2, 1. But that the Jewish people have a double whammy. They not only have that natural, normal, human spiritual blindness, but on top of that, they have this callousing from God as a judgment against them for rejecting their Messiah. And it's not a total callousing, because if it was a total callousing, no Jewish person for 2,000 years would have ever come to Christ. Da 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 da. <laughs> there are Jewish people who come to Christ. It's not a total hardening, but it is very difficult to lead a Jewish person to Christ. Why? Because you got a double whammy that you're trying to deal with in terms of their blindness to the gospel. But the Bible is telling us that, look, rest of the verse, there is a partial hardening that has happened to the Israel. Next word. Until. Oh, what a beautiful word. What a beautiful word. You know what that word means? It means this is not going to last forever. That's what it means. It means this is not a permanent situation until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Come into what? Come into the church come into faith in Christ, and then all Israel that's still alive, I don't have time to do an entire course on eschatology here, will be saved. So, let me say to you, every time you see a Gentile come to Christ, hold your breath. He or she may be the last one in. <laughs> I'm serious. They may be the last one in, and all of a sudden, if the rapture happens, Jesus comes back, the Jews turn to Christ, and away we go. So when you lead a Gentile to Christ, just take a moment, listen for a trumpet. <laughs> if you don't hear it, great. Go on with your business. <laughs> now, let's conclude this passage from the standpoint of the gospel. They're enemies for your sake because they oppose the gospel. But from the standpoint of God's election, they are beloved on account of of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now, theologically, the most important verse in the entire Bible regarding the future of the Jewish people, here it is, for God's gifts, Romans eleven twenty nine 29, to the Jewish people, and his call on the Jewish people are what? Irrevocable. Irrevocable. So let's summarize, folks. The church has not replaced Israel. The church is a parenthesis, uh, a pause in God's plan, a plan which always has had and a plan which always will have the Jewish people at its core. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yes. All right. And this is good theology. This is right theology. This is biblical theology. Now, we have to ask our most important question before we quit and it's short, trust me. All right, so are you all ready? Yes. All right, you know what it is now, right? All right, we don't even need to give you a hint, do we? But we did. Okay, here we go. Come on now, ready? One, two, three. Mm, mediocre. One, two, three. Better. All right. So friends, listen. This is biblical theology, what we have just studied. God is not through with the Jewish people yet. And the greatest proof of that is the existence of the modern state of Israel. It is one of the most miraculous things God had, has ever done in the history of the world. There are five great miracles involved in the modern state of Israel. Let me tell you what they are very quickly. Now, miracle number one is no people 
has ever survived without a homeland for 1,900 years except the Jewish people. Miracle number two, no people has ever gotten their homeland back after losing it for 1,900 years except the Jewish people. Miracle number three, no language has ever died out as a living spoken language and been revived as a living spoken language except Hebrew. Miracle number four, upon Israel's Declaration of Independence, May 14, 1948, five Arab nations, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Syria, with a population then of 26 million people, declared war on Israel, which had a total population, men, women, and children at the time, of 650,000 people. Israel had no uh, heavy artillery, they had no tanks, they had no warplanes, and they still won. And miracle number five is that President Harry Truman recognized Israel a mere 11 minutes after it declared its independence. You say, why is that a miracle? Friends, it's a miracle because the U.S. government never does anything in 11 minutes. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Right? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen. <laughs> Jeremiah 49, verse 2, God says, Then Israel shall dispossess those who dispossess them, says the Lord. Isn't that what's happened in your lifetime? Isn't that what ha what's happened? Some of your lifetimes. All right. And then Ezekiel 36 for I will take you from among the nations and I will gather you from all countries and I will bring you into your land. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. And folks, can you see that even 20 centuries of Israel's unbelief could not, did not, and cannot cancel out the faithfulness of Almighty God to his promises. Do you see that? Do you see that? Yes. All right. Now, let me close and say that on a personal level, you know, there are some times when I um, really struggle to believe that God is going to keep his promises to me. I, I mean, it's because uh, that the odds seem so great. It's because that the, um, the outlook seems so hopeless. It's because the, uh, uh, the situation looks so bleak, and I begin to say, God, I know what you promised me, but I don't see how you're ever going to keep them. Lord, I don't see how these are ever going to come true. Do, do, have you guys ever felt like that? Well, if you, if you haven't, you should be up here preaching instead of me. Of course we all feel that way. And then you know what? I look at Israel. I look at a map and I see that little country there that says Israel. And I say to myself, you know what? If God could do what he did with Israel, if God could keep the promises that he made to Israel, folks, do you understand how astronomical the odds were that this could ever happen? The Jewish people were living in ghettos. The Jewish people had no military power. The Jewish people had no economic power. The Jewish people had no political power. The Jewish people had nothing, nothing. And yet out of nothing, God created the state of Israel in spite of 25 and a half million people opposing it with arms. And I look at that and I say, Lord Jesus, I may have a problem and the odds for me may not be good, but I'll tell you what, my odds weren't as bad as Israel's odds. And if you can do that for them, you can do that for me. And that brings hope to my life. And that brings courage and faith back into my life that God's going to do what he said, whether it looks impossible or not. And so I want to encourage you. If you're struggling with that, or the next time you do, God's faithfulness to Israel means that God will keep his promises to you. Do we understand that? And I want you next time you get down and you begin to doubt that to walk around and just go, Israel! <laughs> Israel! 
Israel. God can do it for them. He can do it for me. And at work, if your boss gives you a hard way to go, you just walk in the restroom and get in the stall and walk around and go, Israel, <laughs> Israel, Israel. And somebody walks in the bathroom and thinks you've lost your mind, you just come out of the stall and look at them and go, Israel, <laughs> Israel. That's right. You remember God's faithfulness to Israel and friends it'll encourage you that God's going to be faithful to you. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what we've been able to study today. Lord, grant that we might be people of good theology. Grant that we might be people who understand and know the Word of God, and we know what it teaches. And Lord Jesus, thank you you have not replaced Israel. That 20 centuries of their unbelief could not stop the faithfulness of God to do what he said. And Lord Jesus, remind us that I don't care what obstacle is in front of us. I don't care how impossible it looks that, Lord Jesus, you can overcome any obstacle. You are bigger than any obstacle. And that if we trust you, you indeed will keep every promise you made to us. Lord, encourage our hearts today to trust you. Encourage our hearts today to believe you, even though things look bleak. Lord, help us to remember God is bigger. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And what did everybody say? Amen. Amen. All right, listen. We're going to sing a wonderful song in closing called Great is Thy Faithfulness. I think you know it, right? But it says, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto... Excuse me, you know this song? Okay. Lord, great is thy faithfulness unto me. That's right. And just remember, there are only two things you can do every day, every moment of every day. You can doubt God, you can trust God. That's it. Folks, there's nothing in between. You're either going to doubt God or trust God in that moment, on that day, on that week. I don't know about you, I've seen God do way too much in my life to doubt Him. I can't. So my only choice, even if it's hard, even if it's painful, even if I don't understand, my only choice is to trust Him. And that's what I've tried to do my whole life. Folks, you don't have any choice either. Really. If you know Christ, you can't doubt Him. So trust Him. Actively. Without apology. I promise you when the dust clears, He's going to keep every promise and more he made to you. You say, well, I can't see it. Well, you don't have to. You're not God. Praise the Lord for that. Okay. God doesn't need you to see what he's going to do, and he doesn't need you to see how he's going to do it. He just needs you to trust him.